सर सर हो
traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, she, she is going to present today and the community effect of Tedrion in broad acoustics for all cells and zebra fish. It's my pleasure to invite Dr. Wong. Can you hear me, Dr. Wong? Hello. The voice is very low. Uh, should I start? It's okay. We hear you very well. So please go ahead. I can start now? Yes, you can start. Okay, okay. Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to show uh, my uh, research work here. Uh, I visited uh, uh, ICCPS in 2019 in uh, March. Uh, it's a very beautiful institute. It's a very beautiful center and uh, Mm, have wonderful research works uh, and uh, I'm very glad to uh, cooperation with uh, you all, uh, also. Uh, today, let's show the topic anti-inflammatory effects of dandelion extracts DE in the 2064 Point seven cells and the zebra fish. Uh, my uh, report will include uh, five parts. Uh, first, uh, the background about inflammation. Inflammation is a defensive immune response that occurs because of stimuli such as bacteria or Vital infection, uh, such as stimi, uh, stimuli and uh, cellular damage. Uh, Macrophages uh, play uh, an immune defense function in the inflammatory response through plastic acid and functionally uh, polarization and uh, uh, microphage. Phages can undergo transformation in M1 and M2 uh, phenotypes in spe specific micro environments. And uh, about the uh, dandelion, uh, dandelion is a famous traditional Chinese herb. It has been listed in the uh, natural Pharmacopoeia uh, copy of the People's Republic of China and used to treat infection fever, uh, upper respiratory tract infection, uh, leomolia, and other infectious diseases. And it grows widely in the lost uh, hemisphere and popularly used as a uh, herb medicine in China, uh, West Europe, and uh, America. Uh, Dandelion first appeared in uh, Arabic, uh, Arabic medicine for the treatment of diseases of liver or spleen. Uh, Dandelion plays an uh, important role in the treatment of gut, uh, Blister spleen and liver uh, complaints. And for our objective uh, to establish uh, inflammation models in uh, uh, as of, uh, 2064.7 cells and zebra fish to in investigate the anti-inflammatory activity of Chinese herbal extract, uh, such as dandelion in the cells and the zebra fish models, and to explore their effects on M1 and M2 phenotypic polarizations in the cells. 
uh, our models is uh, LPS induced uh, cellular inflammation and uh, uh, polarization model. And uh, uh, so, uh, CU, uh, SO4 induced the blood inflammation models. Our methods is uh, as water extract of dandelion uh, was obtained and the UPLCQE orbital um, MS analysis was used to detect the components of DE and the low uh, cytotoxic concentrations of the measured by MTTSC uh, observation. Oh, sorry, I sorry, I'm not acting as this. Uh, and the uh, observation of cell morphologic changes by United microscope. Uh, detection of uh, uh, NO production in cell uh, supernatant by a enzyme marker, observation of flow, this is of intercellular ROS and uh, apo apoptosis by fluorescent uh, microscope. And the detection of expression levels of uh, cellular M1 and M2 uh, phenotype genes by RT-PCR and the detection of uh, oxidative, oxidative stress and uh, neutrophil regulated gene expression levels in zebrafish. Uh, this is the uh, 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 photochemical identification of EPS by the UHPLCQEMS. Um, previous, uh, previous studies have found that the components of dandelion are many alkaloids, uh, flavonoids, and so on. In this study, a total of 438 possible uh, DE components were identified in positive and the negative flow mo uh, models. Mo and this is the uh, characterization uh, of chemical co constant constituents in DE by the uh, QEMS analysis. And uh, we can show in the tab. And uh, the effect of the on the activity of the uh, 2064.7 cells should the uh, concentrations of 150 and uh, 300 uh, mi uh, microgram uh, per milliliter were concentration de uh, dependent inhibit inhibit uh, inhibition of cell proliferation. The uh, concentrations uh, below. Uh, 75 uh, were no significant inhibition of cell pro, uh, proliferation and low toxicity to cell survival. And uh, this is the effect of the on the LPS induced uh, morphology in the cells. The cell are uh, Morphology of the contours was irregularly sound. We can see where the cell in the LPS group was larger than that of the contour, which grew irregular tentacles and became shatter shaped. 
and the LPAs induced the cells to adhere to the wall of the plate. The cell uh, morphology of the DE group tended to be similar to the control cells, with some cells reverting to semi adherent round cells. This picture showed the reduced LPS induced an production in cells. Uh, the fluorescence the intensity of NO was significant change with different dose of LPS stimulation in uh, uh, so 2064.7 cells. We can see in this uh, uh, figure. And the LPS could uh, increase intracellular uh, NO production at three hours of LPS stimulation of the uh, 2064.7 cells uh, and the flow, the same intensity of NO in the LPS group was significantly higher compared with the control group. Uh, and our DE could reverse the LPS induced NO of fluorescence intensity, uh, the intensity increase uh, in this figure. And uh, this picture uh, shows the effects uh, of the um, LPS induced uh, intracellular ROS in the 2064.7 cells. We can see the ROS flow the same intensity in the LPS group was significantly higher compared to the country group. And D could reduce the LPS induced ROS of fluorescence intensity. We can see here. Uh, for this picture, we can see the effect of the um, LPS induced cell cycle. We can see the reduced LPS induced apoptosis in the 2064.7 cells and the flow of sedimentary result shows, shows that at six hours of co-stimulation of the 264.7 cells with LPS or DE. The proportion of G0 and G1 and S phase uh, in the 2064.7 cells was significantly reduced in the LPS group compared with the counter group. And the proportion of G2 and M phase the 2064.7 cells was significantly reduced in the LPS group compared with the control group. And our herb, the uh, DE, decreased the proportion of G0 and G1 
uh, one face sales increase the proportion of S face sales uh, decrease the proportion of uh, G two M face uh, sales. And uh, uh, this uh, this fig showed the effects of DEM LPS induced apoptosis in the 2064.7 cells. Uh, whole chest sting showed a significant increase in a uh, fluorescence intensity, uh, intensity in the LPS group and a uh, significant decrease uh, in fluorescence in, uh, intensity in the DE group. And uh, the flow uh, cytometry revolved a significant increase in the proportion of high fluorescence intensity cells and an uh, increase in mean cell of fluorescence intensity in the LPS group and a significant decrease in the proportion of high flow fluorescence intensity cells and uh, mean cell flow fluorescence intensity in the DE treatment group compared to the LPS group. And this figure showed uh, effects of the um, LPS induced uh, polarization of the uh, 264.7 cells. Uh, we can see a uh, pretreat pretreated with DG in LPS model cells showed that DG was found uh, to decrease the mRNA expression levels of LPS induced up regulated genes IO1 and IO2 and INOS and increase the mRNA expression levels of LPS induced down uh regulated uh, genes uh il uh one and il two and ios and uh, let's see this uh, figure uh this figure should uh de reduced uh, uh neutrophil aggregation and uh, ros production in zebrafish now. In zebrafish, a CUSO4 has been shown to, shown to induce a uh, little bit of recruitment and ROS production, and DE could reduce the model uh, induced uh, the uh, neutrophil aggregation in the brafish and uh, the DE could reduce the, the CUSO2 induced ROS uh, production in the brafish. And this uh, figure we can see the reduced the expression of inflammatory genes in the brafish. We can see 
this uh, CuSO2 inducible uh, expression of inflammatory genes in zebrafish and the induced uh, the increased uh, expression of INOS, IO6, and uh, IL10, and TNF alpha. And uh, DE could inhibit uh, the CUSO4 induced uh, uh, INOS and uh, IO6 and IO10 and TNF alpha increase. And this is our experimental uh, environment. Uh, environment. Uh, uh, next, I will introduce the graduate education in CAAS. Uh, first, I will introduce our CAAS. Uh, we uh, were established, uh, established in uh, 1957, uh, embraced uh, its uh, uh, 60 anniversary in uh, 2017 uh, 70, uh, 70, um, and uh, a comprehensive national agriculture and scientific research institute directed to a uh, ministry of agriculture and uh, Zuzer Affairs and the uh, Home Functional Department we have and the uh, 34 directly affiliated institutes and the one graduate school and the one uh, press house. Uh, we have uh, uh, nearly uh, Six thousand uh, researchers uh, accounting for uh, eight uh, five point five uh, six percent of staff and eight percent of total anger scientists in China, and one thousand uh, and eight three professors and uh, uh, 727 doctor, uh, doctor supervisors and 70 uh, academicians and uh, 5,000 and 671,000 students and uh, 184 PhD students on joint program with WUR and ULG and uh, 522 uh, oh, wow. international students and uh, uh, conducting national major basic research, applied basic research and uh, applied research and high-tech technology research in agriculture are these basic indicative comprehensive 
key and major issues of science and technology in agriculture and the rural economic development in China. And uh, this, uh, we have uh, 34 uh, uh, institutes in our CAAS. And from this uh, figure, we can see in Beijing, we have uh, this institutes and uh, Sichuan, Chengdu city and Lanzhou city uh, and uh, Inner Mongolia uh, we have and uh, Wuhan city and Changsha city, Shenzhen city, Hangzhou city, Nanjing city, and so on. Uh, and uh, we have 488 research plan, uh, platforms of various categories, uh, which tops the list in the agricultural institute, uh, institutions uh, nationwide. We have uh, six national key uh, laboratories and two major key a national key facility and for national science and technology uh, in infrastructure and uh, national gene back in the world for number of collections. And uh, this is called gene plasm and uh, genetic improvement. And this is the National Agriculture Library in Asia number uh, three in the world and the national high containment number for animal de, uh, disease control and the prevention, P4 NAMB and agriculture biosafety research. And uh, this scholarships for international student uh, more than a uh, ton scholarship was supported uh, 95% international student, including the uh, Chinese government scholarship, Beijing government scholarship, and the GSCAAS scholarship, and the foreign government university enterprise NGO, uh, etc. And uh, this they support uh, to the following. Uh, we can say from here, a, um, a fee waiver of uh, tuition fee uh, free on campus, dormitory accommodation, and the living earnings per month, and the fee for comprehensive uh, medical ins insurance. And uh, uh, academic fields include uh, national science, agriculture science, engineering science, uh, management science program uh, grams, uh, include, uh, include this three part and the duration of uh, they start uh, usually three years. And the, hello, hello. We have just one minute to finish quickly. We are out of time. The, the, so come the, on, the your, time, your is, time is up. Time is uh, uh, over. Okay, yes, I will. Time is over. I will. Conclude, I will fast. Please. I will fast. Okay. Uh, the, uh, we hold this uh, meeting uh, last year. And uh, we uh, unveiled the China Pakistan Joint Research Center for Nutrition and Health in IFST and ICCBS last year. Uh, thank you. Welcome to IFST. Thank you. Thank you very Wish for one quick question. Uh, Dr. Wong, there is a short comment by Professor Paul. Professor Chen Wang, uh, thank you very Hello. much for joining. Can you Hello. hear me? Uh, yes, 
uh, but not very clear. Okay, I'll try to be uh, slow and clear. I want you to appreciate on behalf of uh, ICCPS your lecture and also your very active collaboration, especially for the establishment of Sino Pakistan Center for Food and Nutraceutical. Thank you very much. Cheshe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akamon. It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker of this afternoon session. Uh, Professor Zakatia Abbas, uh, Zakatia Abdul Mahal. I apologize for my 30 years of my trying to spread in my way. Uh, Professor Zakatia Abdul Mahal, uh, she's a leading scientist in our institution. Uh, she has a, a great contribution in the recent past. With six years patents for more than 10 patents and reviews. Uh, more than 80 publications, uh, three books, uh, including the co-authorship of the book, Solving Problems with the Memorial Spectroscope, and given a respective teacher, Professor Atal Rahman and Professor Anibal Jardi. Uh, she she won more than 30 external research grants uh, for more than a million US dollars to this institution. Uh, has done Couple of postdocs, the first with the uh, Nobel laureate Professor Dr. Kurt with the um, Majora USA, and the second postdoc with the Stevens Institute of Biology with Professor Helen Schwari at uh, the University of Germany. She has been married to scholarship for PhD to study as from higher education of Pakistan. Uh, she was awarded with the uh, Fakir's PhD partial support program also. Um, and so uh, let me straight away introduce uh, Professor Pia for his great presentation today, application of an MR spectroscopy in molecular, uh, molecular chemistry and inside the uh, protein structure and protein reduction. Thank you so much uh, for your very kind introduction. So uh, I will be discussing about uh, the application of NMR spectroscopy in biomolecular chemistry. And uh, basically my field is uh, related to protein NMR and uh, I've been using uh, this technique for uh, determination of the structures of protein and also to find uh, ligand and protein interaction. Uh, we all know that uh, proteins are very important and it is uh, estimated that uh, a range of 2 to 4 million proteins uh, per cubic micron in bacteria yeast and mammalian exists and all uh, the biological activity are uh, rely on their structure. And uh, proteins are uh, important drug targets and it's an important part for the drug development process. And uh, so uh, I would actually go a little bit further. So instead of introducing proteins, but we all know about the uh, importance of proteins. So NMR is a very versatile tool. And uh, we use this tool for uh, uh, structure determination of protein and the small molecule vegan binding dynamics, uh, metabolic profiling, and drug lead optimization. So the main objective of my presentation is to uh, identify the structures of protein and their function, and uh, also to annotate the possible role of these proteins in the life cycles of microorganisms and to their likelihood to become drug targets for drug discovery. So there are, for protein structure determination, there are uh, some key steps. It's, it's, uh, this is the field in which um, there are critically two parts. One is the wet lab and the other is the NMR spectroscopy. In the wet lab, um, the protein target selection and the cloning uh, expression of the protein isotopic labeling, purification, and optimization 
are uh, critically important and there are several steps in which which are kind of uh, what lack in uh, structural biology and uh, the key steps for uh, nmr sample so one, once we have the nmr uh, sample protein ready for we report uh, using one dnmr and uh, critically, 2D NMR factors protein, which is cysteine and HSQT. We all know that each amino acid has the amide linkage, and so we can easily observe NH link NH of uh, um, each amino acid uh, in HSQT. So um, when the protein is very well folded, so it means since this technique, uh, we can observe at atomic resolution. So we can see each amid uh, signal separately. And if the protein is not folded, well folded, or it's oligomerized, uh, uh, then uh, it's uh, all the piece of amid just come in very uh, small, uh, tiny range of uh, chemical shape. And uh, once we have the um, a good HSQC, then, uh, for example, I would like to show. So this is kind of good HSQC that you can see each amid resonance separately. And this is the spectrum in which you can see there are some residues which is very well folded, uh, but there are some here like this, which is uh, uh, unfolded part of the protein. So this all kind of things we usually observe. And once we have the uh, good protein in our hand uh, that we decide looking at the 2D spectrum that we can take it to the spectrum determination. Then we go back and then doubly label it. At least doubly label is required. In some in some cases we need to have the triply label. Doubly label means we have to 15 and 13 C labeling. Uh, 13 C is, uh, is the, the source for the 13 C is. Uh, is uh, 13 C glucose, and in which uh, that's the only source we provide, and uh, labeled ammonium chloride is the only source for the nitrogen for uh, bacteria. Equally, we should be including the expressed um, to grow, and uh, that's why all the proteins that we express becomes uh, labeled protein. And in case if we need to have the triple labels, means we need to grow these cells in butyrated water. So then all the edge will be replaced by nutrients. So that uh, sometimes require triply label when the protein size is quite big, it's more than 10 to the So once uh, we have the double labeled uh, protein, then uh, we record number of NMI experiments, uh, um, triple resonance experiment for the backbone assignment and no yeast for the uh, side chain assignments and also it is required to get the distance between each nuclei so that uh, is used for the structure calculation and so it's kind of a iterative process and it's uh, still the structure is, is submitted to the protein diagram. So uh, what's part of my presentation is uh, drug repurposing and um, uh, since uh, the pandemic started, so we have selected an important target when the structure of it's uh, it's in in a few months time the structure of uh, AMPRO has been deposited in protein data bank. So uh, we use that uh, structure. Actually, we got the sequence of the protein and we uh, have done the expression and purification of uh, uh, main protease of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this is a very well-known target uh, for the, uh, for, because it plays an important role in viral replication and uh, processing of viral uh, polyprotein. So it's a very highly conserved protein uh, and in different coronaviruses as well as in different variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, there are many computational x-ray crystallographic approach that has been adopted for uh, to spe specify the leach molecules uh, against SARS-CoV-2 main protease 
uh, we have used uh, an MR based screening method to identify uh, ligands that can interact with AMPRO. And uh, here you can see that once the uh, SARS CoV 2 enter to the cell after binding with the ACE and CAMP receptor. So these uh, viral RNA um, uh, finally when uh, uh, produce AMPRO and PLRO and these two important protease is required uh, for the proteolysis of uh, non-structural proteins. And if we inhibit uh, these two proteases, uh, these two proteases, AMPRO and PLRO, so it means the non-structural protein of the virus will not be produced and it will not go in the replication cycle. So that is why uh, it's an important uh, target uh, that we try to use it. And uh, during NMR-based uh, method, we have evaluated 150 drugs and compounds uh, in mixtures. So um, our teacher, Dr. Iqbal Chaudhary, has uh, suggested us that instead of, because NMR is, uh, is a technique which requires, takes lots of time. So he suggested that instead of uh, we have to check uh, uh, each compound and each um, or any uh, drug for the NMR, individually we have to make a mixture. Um, and the mixture uh, would be based on the resonances which need to be a little bit separate from each other. So we can identify so, and also it should be soluble uh, in nutrated buffer, which is one of the challenging tasks uh, for the small molecules to be solubilized. Uh, but because of uh, his very kind guidance, we were able to uh, put our efforts in the direction that instead of checking, spending much more time, we just do the very quick screening of the compounds with the uh, uh, protein uh, in the mixture and with a uh, very short time number of scans are much less in NPDMR. So once we find some kind of interaction in each, uh, in any mixture, then we have already the proton NMR of each compound. So then we do the long run experiment to identify which one is the, uh, so which part of the region is real and good interaction with the protein. So, uh, and then uh, these mixture, each we said for this one we have like five compounds. And after identifying uh, some of the drugs, uh, we have uh, Dr. Saba Farooq. She has uh, uh, developed this uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, assays. So we have given um, requested Dr. Saba to perform the uh, to check this antiviral activity of these uh, drugs. So these are the slides. This one has been provided by Dr. Saba, which shows the uh, propagation of SARS-CoV-2 in various cell lines, and she has also done the for the confirmation. Uh, different uh, PCR for identification of different genes for H1, and gene and EG for the confirmation that these cells has an interaction with the uh, um, with viruses. And uh, so the compounds or drugs that we got uh, good interaction are one is uh, methanemic acid, and it's a non steroidal anti inflammatory drug and uh, used in the painkiller to treat mild to moderate brain and this is the spectrum that you can see here H15 and H16. These are the two uh, which has a good interaction uh, from this proton NMR spectrum, this is the SCD spectrum and here uh, is a plate reduction assay um, that uh, Dr. Saba has performed and it shows 81.8 percent uh, reduction in viral plagues uh, after treatment of these compounds with 82.3 micromolar concentration. Similarly, another drug which is uh, dantazen hydrochloride, which is a calcium channel blocker, also uh, shows an interaction with the H4 and H28 and 29. Here you can see these and these are interacting um, more profoundly. Uh, with the uh, with the protein AMPRO 
and uh, it also shows 81 points each percent uh, uh, plate production and uh, dexamethasone, is zone which is also used uh, also given to uh, patients as well and uh, here we could find out uh, from these colors interaction uh, you can see a uh, different level of uh, uh, percentage uh, interaction with the uh, we have observed and this shows 77 percent uh, plate uh, reduction and another uh, compound a drug which is anethidium hydrochloride it's uh, used to treat the symptom of Parkinson's disease we could also find it's a small molecule, so almost the whole part of the molecule is interacting with the different percentage. Uh, these color codes are actually showing different percentage of the interaction with the protein. Uh, and uh, here is a uh, uh, time between K8, and uh, it also shows uh, some interaction, and specifically uh, at 16 and 17 um, shows uh, good interaction. And also shows seventy percent deletion. And uh, there are two compounds. So we, we we have the quite uh, uh, good interaction, but um, the percentage reduction was about fifty nine percent. And uh, this was uh, uh, the potassium. It also shows uh, good interaction and uh, also the plate reduction fifty four percent. And so this is chloroquine phosphate. Uh, this is emergency drug which is approved by FDA for COVID uh, um, patients. And so we also find uh, it has uh, some interaction as part of the molecules interacting and it shows the effect to at this particular concentration 100% deletion. But we have uh, reduced the concentration to half and just a and so this is the standard we have been compared with the silver as well as we find uh, the as an interaction and the decision. And uh, this is uh, the temperature uh, melting curve that we have uh, performed with the protein leaving interaction and we find that uh, uh, methanemic acid that is a that is a hydrochloride and methylene hydrochloride also has uh, good uh, as compared to the other um, tem uh, lowering the temperature, which would be the destabilizing the as and uh, so the next part of my presentation are the solution structures of uh, proteins. And uh, uh, I have been doing uh, this structure of, the, of these uh, my proteins, which are from Staphylococcus aureus or some other organism, um, uh, because this uh, are we really are the important um, to identify uh, the new drug targets uh, along with the new drug candidate for us. And uh, one of the uh, proteins that uh, we have solved the structure. It's uh, mutex hydrolase, which is DNA mixed batch repair protein from MRI state. And uh, it belongs uh, to the family of uh, phosphohydrolase. And the mutex hydrolase in found, uh, is found in all classes of organism and hydrolyzed in a wide variety of organic phosphatases, including uh, nucleoside dye and triphosphatase, nucleoside, nucleoside sugars, etc. And uh, there, uh, this protein is uh, uh, it's a, a prototypical mutex hydrolase uh, that is like the hydrolysis of nucleoside and deoxynucleoside uh, antibodies and BNTPs by substitution beta phosphorus to eight nucleotide monophosphate and inorganic uh, phosphate. So this is the sequence of the protein uh, for the NMR uh, for solving the structures by using NMR. We should have the sequence of the protein, and we have recorded uh, uh, different NMR spec uh, experiments on about 800 by 100 spectrometers. These are the triple resonance uh, experiments and movies, and uh, these are the three D um, proxies experiments uh, that we have recorded. And uh, these are the backbone assignments of this protein, which backbone means like which mean I think um, actually representing uh, which uh, contour representing uh, 
this particular amino acid. So you can see this uh, each contour has been, has been designated to a particular amino acid for which it belongs and uh, after several months of lots of hard work we finally got the structure and uh, this uh, then we tried to find out uh, the function of the protein using NMR spectroscopy again. So we have uh, find out that this uh, uh, methyl binding protein with uh, uh, interaction with the magnesium methyl binding. So we identify this region which is in green. It's binding uh, with the methyl and uh, it also binds with the AMP and ATP, the purple region. We have actually titrated uh, the protein with the a number of metals and uh, uh, first after reviewing the literature and a number of uh, nucleotides uh, AMPs, ATPs, uh, a number of it and so we find that these two are interacting with the protein. So these are the structural characteristics of which it means uh, it can skip. And uh, um, this is another protein, which is a uh, glycidol specific uh, component from MRSA. And uh, it's involved in the uh, sugar transport system. And uh, in uh, specifically, this uh, uh, phosphotransferase system, PAP PPS, it's a multi component system. And uh, here um, you can see that. Uh, uh, the phosphorus transfer is a long uh, process in which multi component uh, system of proteins are involved. And here uh, we have tried to get the structure of ECD, and so which is uh, glucitol, glycitol binding protein, and it's uh, 92 amino acids. And again, we have recorded a number of uh, number of binds for uh, uh, this protein. And this is the proton NMR spectrum. Uh, uh, this is a uh, very well dispersed uh, structure. Act as a matter of fact, um, we have uh, uh, for our students, we have uh, proton NMR, just one dimension NMR, but we have all the information there. The only problem, there are so much overlap that we need other dimensions to resolve this information to get really good information. So all the information, because you can see this is a very uh, small range. And here you can see this is the HSPC spectrum and uh, which shows uh, um, that each amino acid is being uh, designated and Finally, after getting the structure, it's uh, um, this is uh, 20 NMR confirmed, and uh, it's a ribbon representation. It's a, a backbone representation, and it's a side chain representation of uh, the protein. And uh, we have find out that uh, in uh, isoleucine I67 and Staphylococcus aureus is actually replaced by valine in MRSA, this protein which we have talked to belongs to um, MRSA 250B, which is a methylene protein. And uh, these are the structural characteristics. So uh, you can see this is quite well defined the structure with 78 present amino acids. Uh, amino acids are uh, in the most favored region of chromogenin plot. And uh, we got quite good noses as well. The number of specifically the number of uh, noses in the aliphatic region is pretty very important to get the correct structure. And uh, this is uh, uh, Dali search result, and we could find uh, there are some you know, uh, matches to the structure and alignment with the other proteins uh, as. Uh, we compared with uh, Dali, the sequence similarity with other proteins is not much, but there are some kind of uh, structural similarity that's not fully overlapped. So, another protein which is so we have which we have solved the phage related protein from body blood bronchitis. 
and uh, this is the first structure at the time uh, when we reported and it has it is 141 amino acid protein and uh, um, these are then more experiments that were recorded to solve the structure of this protein and uh, we have a Ramachandran statistics which shows that this protein is also <coughs> very uh, good with 77.4% residues in its most favored region of the amino acids and here is a secondary structure element plot and here you can see this is C alpha minus C beta uh, which is plotted against the sequence of the amino acids so we can see these uh, two patches which is upwards are actually alpha helices. Uh, these are two alpha helices and uh, these are the uh, the small which is downward patches are the um, beta sheets or beta strands which shows a different region of the sequence and so this is the nose that we can see so here in alpha helix we can see they are very compact with each other so we always observe more nodes uh, i plus i uh, four uh, after four amino acids, and so those with the beta uh, strand, we usually observe less number of proteins. And we also have recorded the uh, heteronuclear NOE experiment, and we uh, plot the intensity against the uh, uh, which is this uh, sequence of amino acids. And we could also see this is the region where you know you can see uh, uh, much more. Uh, shift of uh, the intensity is because of uh, this is a long globular part and the while the other which is very very close to our globular part of the protein so it's also another good experiment which shows which part of the protein is uh, very well coded so this is a different representation of the protein and these other side chain um, and uh, we have compared with other proteins as well. And this is, again, we have checked with the binding uh, titration experiment uh, with the uh, magnesium, and to be found that there are different uh, regions, it's not specific, but it's uh, magnesium binding in different regions. So there are other proteins as well, which uh, we have solved. So um, in conclusion, NMR is a very robust technique for constructive examination of the protein. Um, although it's a, it has several limitations, one of the greatest strength of NMR is uh, its capacity to determine the protein to be and protein ligand interaction in uh, in real buffer condition in dynamic. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge my students. Uh, uh, who have worked in cloning, protein cloning in expression and uh, Abdul also have, uh, along with the expression, he has also uh, done the FCDNMR experiments and uh, Dr. Sabah Farooq uh, for antivirus. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for all the questions. Uh, the question, I think you mentioned that the protein needs to be um, older than the um, right? Uh, yeah, it's uh, much easier to get the structure. You know, it, it, it is possible. I'm sorry. It is possible to work on uh, unfolded, but it's uh, uh, quite complicated because most of the resonance is done for one fold. My question is actually is there a potential to have it in the group or a protein and not in the group? Because obviously, it's a lot of the Yeah, uh, they are last user actually working in this in terms of these audit protein. Because there are many proteins which are like this. And uh, actually, uh, I was working with uh, Professor Harold Saudi in uh, Stanford, and his group is also some of the students working in that particular field. 
So people are targeting that also, but it's uh, um, it requires, I think, uh, uh, maybe one gigahertz to get a more clear picture because they are um, all the resonances are at one place and we have quite a number of resonances, so it's difficult to get a good resolution. Is Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce the last speaker of this organization. Okay, yes. What all the foreign could be seated? All the foreign could be seated. Nobody could be blown. Please take the seats. Uh, uh, despite I have listened uh, plenty of times, it's really difficult to pronounce the name of the Texas people. Uh, this is. Yes. I apologize, my apology for you for not being able to pronounce the name. Um, uh, the next speaker, she is, is very well known to us, is Jenny uh, Fraser, she's OG, and uh, numerous short and long term fellowships uh, in this kind, for example, the Emerald Track, Dodd, Welcome Trust. And the Peak Mystery Education Fellowship uh, from several countries like France, Ireland, Germany, Fiji, and Poland. She's Honorary Research Fellow of Children uh, Terminal College in England. And uh, Madam Minister of Education in Ukraine. Uh, he's involved also ESC, Legend Professor to our institution, uh, overseas. Yes, expert at the National Center for International Research on Food Authenticity Technology in Beijing, China. Uh, he's going to present today his favorite topic, the more spectroscopy, as applied to bioorganic chemistry, which is part of analytical chemistry, chemistry in the least structural biology. So, uh, so the mic is yours. Professor, uh, yes, sir. Mike is over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee for uh, the kind invitation. Uh, my presentation will be divided into three parts. The first one is how to use NMR as an analytical and metabolomics tool, how to use NMR as a structural tool, and last but not least, how to use NMR in order to investigate protein natural product interactions. Now, the classical approach when we have a plant extract is to apply various chromatographic methods for the separation and isolation of the individual components and then by the combined use of mass spectrometry and NMR to do structural elucidation. I will not discuss about these rather tedious processes. I will not even discuss about hyphenated methodologies where you couple a liquid chromatography with solid phase extraction of the NMR. I will just speak about how to apply NMR that if you apply an MR to a plant extract and you spread the peaks in two dimensions, proton and carbon-13, then you can notice that there are regions of the spectrum where it is practically impossible to do any, any resonance assignment. Now, the methodology which I will present 
is how to extend the classical zero to 10 ppm chemical shift range with the use of phenol OH chemical shifts, how to use strongly desilded CH resonances, and also the combined use of proton carbon 13H SQC and HMBC experiments in combination with one dimensional spin chromatography experiments. Now, why observation of SARP OH proton NMR signals is important? It is important because the OH groups are the most abundant functional groups in natural products. Now, the hydroxyl groups, however, contain exchangeable protons. As a result of that, the peaks, which are in the very desilded region, are extremely broad. However, if we make the appropriate selection of the extraction solvent, then we can get extremely sharp peaks in the highly desilded region above 9 ppm. But if we use methanol or water as an extraction solvent, then we get nearly nothing in this region here. The question is, how can we transform a featureless spectrum like that to a highly informative spectrum like that one? The answer is by changing the pH. Without triphthoroacetic acid, you get a spectrum like that. With triphthoroacetic spectrum, you can get maybe hundreds of peaks in the highly desilic region, where even this peak here is split into seven sharp resonances. But if we can get so many peaks in this region above 9 ppm, what else can we do? We can spread the peaks into dimensions, proton and carbon-13, based on the highly desilded proton and MR chemical shift of this proton here, and of course, to observe in this direction here, carbon-13 connectivity. Uh, we cannot, uh, your slides are not changing. You need to go to the full screen mode and change your slide accordingly. Your presentation is not in a full screen mode. Slides are not changing, they are freezed. So you, you cannot see the change. No. We cannot see the slide show. It's the first slide and it's uh, freezed, I think. The screen is shared, but it's not moving. Can you see now? I can see the slide, but it's not changing. Could you please change the, the, the slide numbers? Can you see now the change? No. no. Just stop sharing.
Can you see now? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, now. okay. So you can see now that there are a total of five correlations on carbon-13. So we can say that those two resonances here belong to the same group of analytes. If, you, if we move now to this type of compounds, you can see again now that this carbon-13 profile is completely different than that one. And of course, the resolution which we, you can get is, is, is a very good one. And therefore, you can make the complete analysis of your mixture without any chromatography. But what can we do if the compounds of interest do not contain OH groups? Artemisianoa is also a typical example because artemisin contains a CH group, which is in alpha position with respect to two heteroatom oxygens, which can result now in a strong disilde of this proton resonance. As a result of that, if we make now a proton carbon-13 HSQC and HMBC experiment, then you can find correlations of this proton here with nearly all of the carbons. And this is exactly what you can see here. This region between 5.5 and 6.5 ppm, although we have now a mixture, you can see there are relatively few resonances. This is the number H5 proton of artemisinin, and it shows now a, a total number of eight carbons. So this is a very nice fingerprint. And this is also the case of the other analyte, which is deoxyartemisinin. Again, we see the H5. But here, you can notice also a doublet, which is due to arteanoin B. Arteanoin B does not contain an H5, but you have also a disilded resonance because it belongs to an olefinic double bond proton. Again, the spectrum here will show four connectivities, and therefore you can make the assignment as well as the integration without any chromatographic isolation. Now, since this peak here appears as a doublet, what else can we do? For example, this is the actual spectrum. You can see in this region here, maybe thousands of strong peaks. We are interested on this doublet here. And now, if you make a selective one detoxy in this region here, you can see now that all those resonances will be eliminated. And you can find now the very nice connectivities to those protons. Therefore, we can make now the identification of proton connectivities, which are in extremely high overcrowded region. This method also is extremely useful if you try now to do the analysis of probably the most complex natural product. This is the lipid fraction of milk, which is composed of more than 400 saturated, monosaturated, and polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, conjugated linolenic acids is a, a very complex mixture of geometric isomers. Nine cis, 11 trans, trans cis, cis cis, trans trans. And also, if this is a typical proton NMR spectrum of milk, these are the resonances due to the olefinic protons. If we make a vertical expansion of this region, then you can observe that we have some multiples. Those multiples is exactly due to the olefinic part of conjugated linolenic acids, which might be now the result if we do now a selective one detoxy of this multiple. In order to understand the potentialities of this methodology, let's examine the case of an isolated CLA. In other words, we have nine cis, 11 trans double bonds. 
you can observe in this desilded region multiplets because of those polyphenic protons. Now let's make now a selective excitation only of this resonance here. And we leave flow of magnetization for 33 milliseconds. Although we excite only this reson resonance, we can observe four additional resonances. If we increase the mixing time, we can observe more resonances. And if we increase it to 400 milliseconds, we get a spectrum which is identical to the one dimensional spectrum. Now, let's try now to apply this method, not to the isolated analyte, but in mixture analysis. Now, this is a proton LMR spectrum of cis, of the lipid fraction. If we make now a selective excitation here, you can see that we eliminate all those strong resonances, some of which are nearly 1,000 to 5,000 more intense. As a result of that, the strong resonances are eliminated and you can observe the whole spin system of this analyte. If we make a selective excitation here, we can get now the spectrum of caprolaic acid. If we make a selective excitation here, we can get now the spectrum of diglycerides. In other words, it's like to apply a chromatographic dimension, but based on the spin properties of the various analytes. Now, the advantage of this methodology is that you can record each of those spectra within five to 10 minutes. Therefore, if you like now to make a metabolite profile of the lipid fraction, for example, of organic and conventional meat, then you can record the spectra of hundreds of samples, and then to find out which analytes make the distinction between organic and conventional milk, organic and conventional cheese. Now, oxidation of foods is also a very important issue. For example, you may have only oleic methyl ester, and if you heat it, then you can find that there are plenty of resonances in the disease in the region. And this is due to the oxidation, which results in the formation of some primary oxidation products. Now, this process is uh, a very complex process because we have double bond migration, 10 to 11, but also we have a rotation around the single bond here. And as a result of that, we have the formation of trans and cis isomeric products. What can we do with this complex phenomenon? Now, an MPhil, Rahil Ahmed, seems to resolve this ambiguity. In this case, you apply a proton carbon 13 HMBC experiment. If you do that, you can connect now this proton here with this carbon which means now that those trans isomers have a distinct chemical shift difference, which is around 87 ppm for, from those of the cis isomers. Therefore, although on the proton NMR chemical shift, you cannot make a distinction between cis and trans isomers, you can do that very easily in the carbon-13 dimension. Now, if you like to apply this methodology to polyunsaturated fatty acids, this situation is even more complex. Because if you leave it at 40 degrees Celsius for 48 hours, then you can get more than 50 oxidation products. What can we do about this problem? You may notice also we have plenty of peaks in the highly deserted region. Originally, we thought that these were secondary oxidation products, which are aldehydes protons. But in fact, this is not the case. If you add D2O, D2, oh, then you can see that those resonances are eliminated. So these are indeed primary oxidation products. They are hydroperoxides. And they are strongly dissolved because of the formation of in its intramolecular hydrogen bonding interaction. So what can we do? 
Let's spread now the resonances in two dimensions. This is the proton dimension, and this is the carbon-13 dimension. So you can see now along this line here, connectivity of this carbon to this proton, which is the hydroperoxide proton, to this proton here, it's this doublet here, carbon number to proton 17 and 18. But then you can do even the assignment of even complex endohydroperoxides, which is the result of a double oxidation products. Again, you can make the complete assignment of the proton and carbon-13 resonances, even in the presence of very, very strong analytes. We are looking only to those more resonances. What else can we do now? We can move now to the second part. You can do a structural investigation. Now, there are three methods to derive high resolution structures. One method is the X-ray diffraction, neutral diffraction, and the use of NMR through NOE experiments. But the NMR chemical shifts are ultimately related to the properties of the bonding electrons around its nucleus, around its atom. Can we use this property now to derive three-dimensional structures in solution? The answer is, in principle, yes. We can do a density functional theory application. In this case, we can describe properly a large number of electrons with very accurate basis set. Now, hypericy is a well-known phytochemical. Now, the interesting point with this molecule is that the pK value of this phenol type OH group is extremely low, is extremely acidic. As a result of that, depending upon the solvent which we use, we could have either the OH group, and this is the case in acetone, or it is deprotonated, and this is the case in DMSO. Now, the X-ray structure was resolved already in 1994. And the interesting point is that the X-ray structure showed indeed that this OH group is deprotonated. Now, let's make a comparison now between the X-ray structure and the NMR structure in solution. Now, you can notice here that on this axis, we have the experimental chemical sheet, and the vertical axis, we have the computational data. You can see a reasonable correlation with a rather good correlation coefficient, but this correlation, however, does not pass through zero. So there is a systematic error in the chemical sheet of about 1.44 ppm. However, if we do a DFT optimized geometry and we compare now the experimental chemical set with those computational, then you get an excellent linear correlation with R square 0.999. And the most important, it crosses to zero with a mean square error of only 0.027. But then which is the problem with X-ray crystallography? Let's compare now the two structures. Now, you have a complete agreement with respect to the distances between heavy atoms, let's say oxygen and oxygen, even to the third decimal. But the position of hydrogen, and this is extremely important in hydrogen bonding interactions in the X-ray structure are completely wrong. Okay, but if this is so, is it possible then to investigate solvent-dependent three-dimensional structures? In other words, how the structures change as a function of solvent? This problem was tackled by an Enfield student, Saina Marie. She used those three phytochemicals, and she found that this part of the molecule, where we have a very strong intramolecular hydrogen bonding interaction, the solvent cannot approach. The solvent is pushed away. But this is not the case of this phenol OH group. And then she succeeded, derived structures, where now we have not only the structure of the molecule, but how the solvent molecule is arranged around this molecule. Now let's try now to make a comparison 
between solution structures and X-ray structures. Now, there is an excellent agreement between experimental proton and MR chemical sets and DFT calculator. This is about the NMR structures. But if you like now to compare the experimental proton NMR chemical sets with computational chemical sets, with as an input the X ray structure, you can get no correlation. So, is it possible now to use this methodology in more complex situations where, for example, this is a typical example of endo hydroperoxide, where we have three asymmetric carbons. As a result of that, we can have a total number of eight stereoisomers, which belong to four pairs of enantiomers. Is it possible now to make a distinction between thread and erythro stereoisomers? This problem was resolved by this man who used again the computations of the proton and MR chemical sets. And he used as a criteria the strengths of intramolecular hydrozymbotic interaction, which strength of hydrozymbotic interaction is different between erythrostereoisomers and stereoisomers. So the two classes can be distinguished. But can we distinguish almost the various stereoisomers which are of the erythro type. This research is now under investigation. Now, let's move now to the last part of my presentation. How can we study interactions between natural products and proteins? There are basically two methods. One is the saturation transfer difference method. And the other one is the interlinked adenoids for pharmacom for mapping, they're known as in PARMA methodology. Now, yeah. the one dimensional STD experiment is very simple. You make the saturation of the protein, and then if you have a ligand which interacts with the protein, then you have also a saturation of the resonances. The difference will show now which analyte interacts with the protein. Now, Let's try to apply this method to a large protein, which is serum albumin. There are seven binding sites. But the problem with X-ray crystallograph. Excuse me, sir. You have to conclude in two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Excuse me, professor. Uh, uh, the, 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 by X-ray, they could not find which is the position of the fatty acid in the warfarin site. Let's see now what can we do with this problem. Now, the STD experiment shows that, indeed, whenever you add warfarin, you have an elimination of the a reduction of the STD spectrum. So, indeed, caprolaic acid and warfarin, they are competing with ACSA. But we don't know if this competition is an allosteric competition or towards the same binding site. This can be resolved by the PARMA methodology, where if two ligands share a common binding site, then by performing a two-dimensional NOE experiment, you will find also interlingual connectivities. And this is exactly what you can see here. Those two ligands in competition will show also common interlingual NOEs. And this was also the case with warfarin, which shows now extremely strong interlinked adenoids with the free fatty acid. Then why the X-ray structure cannot observe the lipid at this binding site? This is due to the fact that, in fact, we have two conformational states of the lipid in the warfarin binding site. And you, this interconversion between two conformational states is the reason why the X-ray structure could not resolve by X-ray this binding site. Thanks to my group in the University of Ioannina. And I would like also to thank my former but highly talented 
and field stu students in ICCPS. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, as we are already showing time, I think we have no question. And on behalf of the advisory committee, we thank you very much for being here. And we look forward to visiting you again physically next time. Thank you very much. This announcement after the session is uh, the first one is the uh, sightseeing tour organized by the host, and all the foreign engineers are expected to, to be gathered at 6 30 in front of the international guest house, uh, being five minutes earlier. And the second announcement is for, for the future uh, to go for the Indonesian design. Thank you very much. I appreciate your presence. Thank you, sir. Resume at 3.50 and uh, to be there at 3.50. Only 20 minute break.